So listen, last week we started this series called Villains, and we're looking at the kind of the bad guys of Easter. And we started it talking about this idea, the dark side, the dark side. And uh, really, probably when you say the dark side, most people know that through the Star Wars uh, uh, movie series, right? Uh, they talk a lot about the dark side. And they're always talking about like, you know, the dark side, we're going to turn you to the dark side, or you're going to come over to the dark side, or I can see the dark side inside you, and I can feel the dark side inside you, these kind of things like that, right? And we talked about this idea that actually, biblically, the Bible says, yeah, that, that exists. Not so much that you can like move spaceships around with your hands and stuff like that, but that there's a dark side inside of you that actually is, is trying to grow trying to creep out. And, and at some level, you probably try and keep it tamped down. Like, man, I don't want people to know about this. I don't want anybody to see this. And sometimes some of you are like, I don't want it to come out. Yeah, amen. But it's always trying to like, no, I want to I wanna take over. Yeah. I want to rule, right? And so <clears throat> the idea of this series is to look at these bad guys in Easter and, and kind of figure out what made them bad guys. Because what the Bible is saying to us when it says, man, there is something in you. There's the spirit that's in you and it wants to do what God wants to do. And there's the flesh that's in you, this dark side that wants to do what it wants to do. That it's contrary to the spirit, that it's contrary to what God wants to do. The idea is that, man, it lives in you. And just like those Star Wars movies, it wants to take over. It wants to turn you. It wants to use you. And so I want to look at these villains. I don't just want to do this series like, okay, we're coming up on Easter so we could do some Easter theme thing or, or now we know more information about these people. The idea is that we would look at that and say, well, what made them bad guys? What made them villains? And then be able to identify that in us. Man, do I deal with those same things? Is the opportunity there for me to turn in the same way and in that, if we can identify those things and figure them out, maybe we can grow. Maybe we can overcome them. Maybe we can be better. Amen. Maybe, like, raise your hand if you're dealing with some stuff. You're like, man, I don't even need, like, stories to tell me where my dark side is. I see it all the time. Like, it comes out when I talk to this person. It comes out when these people do these things. And You know, right? And the idea is let's identify that. Let's figure it out so that we understand, man, sometimes, like, you know, I, I, I bought this T-shirt, and we start out with this saying, Darth Vader says this thing, you underestimate the power of the dark side. And I think that's true. Like we think like, ah, as long as I keep it kind of contained, as long as it doesn't come out too often, as long as nobody else ever, ever sees it, you think it's okay. But it, it, it grows. Amen. It multiplies. It gets stronger. And at different points, and some of you are old enough to have this happen to you, at different points, you think you're in control and all of a sudden something happens and you snap Amen. and you're not. And all of a sudden some stuff comes out and you're like, I didn't even know that was in there. Amen. Yep. And the idea is to figure it out now in other people's lives so we can get rid of it in ours. Amen? Amen. What that takes is what we were talking about. It takes vulnerability. It takes honesty. It takes humility. It takes the ability to say, man, yeah, that actually, that does live it. Yeah, I've seen those things. Yeah, there are some things in me that just aren't quite right. And that's, I think, tough for us sometimes. We're always kind of trying to put on a show for everybody around us. So we're going to take some time. We're going to pray and we're going to ask God, like, hey, help me be honest. Help me to hear what you're saying. Help me to see what you're trying to point out. And, uh, and we're going to go from there. Amen? So join me in prayer, would you? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to learn from other people's lives, allowing us to see things in their lives so that we can go, oh my gosh, I see that in mine. I haven't done that yet, but what you're telling me is the potential exists and I don't want to be there. Father, you made us to be salt to the earth, light to the earth, and we want to be that in the greatest capacity. We don't just want to keep the darkness at bay in us. We don't just want to keep it trapped away in some closet in our hearts. We want it to be gone. We want it to be dead. Father, help us identify it so that we can deal with it. We ask these things for your glory and in Jesus' name. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to invite you to turn to Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. The most 
The easiest target, obviously, for the villains in, in the Easter story is the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time. Uh, and actually, they were kind of part of the religious leaders. They were the more powerful part, but there were two, there were two kind of groups of religious leaders that were of the same religion. They were Jewish, but they had different theologies, different ways of looking at things. And uh, one was the Pharisees, the other was the Sadducees. Uh, the Pharisees were the, the more powerful part. You hear about them more. Uh, but it's an interesting thing to me because they, they're religious leaders. And it's like, that's, I mean, it's not uncommon anymore, I guess. But you used to think it's like, oh, that guy's a pastor. That guy's a priest. Obviously, they're good people. Right? Oh, those people are Christian. Obviously, they're good people. And how do you go from being someone that's supposed to be telling people, here's how you live in community with God, to being people who are the villains, the bad guys? And I think that there's a lot in this story that we can identify with, that we can go like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, I'm in relationship with God. But what lives in me that can turn me into a villain, that can turn me into the bad guy in someone else's story, right? In in Mark chapter three, Jesus is teaching uh, different things and he's kind of going down and teaching all kinds of different things. And and each time he does, he's kind of, well, he's kind of ticking off the religious leaders. They don't like what he has to say. And he's making them look bad and he's disagreeing with them and they're saying things and he's saying something different. And then they're trying to get the better of him, but they can't. And that makes them look bad even more and makes Jesus look better. And, and this is one of those things. It's in Mark chapter three, we'll start in verse one. It says, another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. So one of the debates that the Pharisees are having with Jesus is this. There are these laws that Jewish people are supposed to live by. One of them is that you don't do any work on the Sabbath. And they have gone to figure out, you know, taken a lot of years to figure out, like, what does that mean? You don't do any work on the Sabbath. This, for them, that was Saturday. That was the, the seventh day. And they, would, they made a bunch of laws around that to say, here's what work looks like. Here's how you define work so everybody can know here's what you do, here's what you don't do. And a couple of different times, Jesus has gone around and he's done things on the Sabbath. And they're like, look, man, you, you, you're, you're like teaching people and you're trying to be a religious leader, but you're telling them the wrong things. Or you're telling them things that we're telling them the opposite. And they don't like that. And all of a sudden, they're at odds. The religious leader, it reaches a point where the religious leaders and Jesus are kind of at odds over certain things. One of them is how you treat the Sabbath, which is ironic. They don't realize who Jesus is, but Jesus is like, I made the Sabbath. I gave you the Sabbath. I know what it's about. And, and this is one of those moments where it kind of comes to a head. It says another time, Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them, these are the Pharisees, were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they weren't there to learn. They weren't there to become better people. They weren't there to get to know Jesus better. It says they were there simply to accuse him. They're watching for that. Like, what can we... Listen, have you ever done this to a person? Where it's like, you're there, but you're, you're not listening to what they're saying. You're not whatever. You're just waiting for a moment. It's like, I, okay, give me something that I can jump on. Anybody ever, be in a, anybody ever been in an argument with someone else? Raise your hand if you've ever, ever in your life been in an argument with someone else, right? If you're married, raise both hands, right? You better watch it. Uh, this is quiet time for you. Uh, you ever, you have, have you ever been, listen, let's, we're talking about honesty. We're talking about vulnerability here. Have you ever been in an argument with someone where you're arguing with them and they're talking, it's, they're, they're like going and you're not really listening to what they're saying to hear their point so much as to know when you can jump in and make yours or where you can call out an inconsistency or where you can say like, well, you said that, but you always, right? Okay. They're not there for Jesus. They're just there to kind of like, okay, we want to, we got to bring this guy down, right? And they try it in various ways. They try and watch what he's doing. They try and point out like, oh, he's not doing this right. At one point, he's doing these incredible things. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's basically the devil. That's how, that's how he's doing it. You know, and Jesus makes him look bad through that idea. They come and ask him questions. They come and ask him questions. They think like, uh, you know, those, those questions that like nobody can answer, right? Like for us, philosophically, one is, uh, uh, what happens when an immovable object uh, meets an unstoppable force? 
And the question itself is designed to be like, well, I don't, it just makes you think. Because you're like, I don't know. How does that work out, right? And so they bring Jesus these questions, and Jesus answers them, which makes them look really bad. And it's like, have you ever seen, how many people have seen My Cousin Vinny? Raise your hand if you've ever seen My Cousin Vinny, right? And the lawyer gets to the point, he's trying to ask questions to the witness, but the witness keeps, he actually goes the opposite direction as the lawyer and makes the lawyer look bad, and the lawyer goes, no more questions for you. And they get to that point where Jesus was like, man, we've tried, we've tried everything. So now they're here. They're trying to watch him and see what they can figure out, see what they can do. It says, they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. They were looking for a reason to accuse him. So they're watching him and it's like, okay, if he breaks the law, we can just tell people, look, he's breaking the law. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Next slide. Then Jesus asked them. So, you know, they, they like to come and ask Jesus questions and call him out and ask these, these questions that don't really have an answer or they're designed like whatever answer you give, it's going to make you look bad. So Jesus says to them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or evil? And if you're the Pharisees, you're like, oh, man, come on, man, this is our game. No more questions for you. <laughs> no more questions for you. Did Jesus ask them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? And then if that's not clear enough, to save life or to kill. And what happens? They remain silent. They're like, there's no good answer to this. Whatever we say, we're going to look bad and you're going to look good. So it says they remained silent. Now listen, watch this. Look at Jesus' reaction to this. He looked around at them in... Man, sometimes you think like we, we deify God in ways that, that take all of his personhood out. And we feel like, oh, God, because he's strong and he doesn't have any vulnerabilities and because he, he doesn't have any weaknesses, he doesn't feel. But actually, Jesus, you see him feel all the time. You see him hurt. You see him get angry. You see him in love. You see his feelings, and it says this. When, when the people who are supposed to be leading God's people, not only, it's not that they don't know the right answer, because, you know, it's an easy question. She's like, the answer is pretty easy. Everybody in the room knows it. But when they won't answer it out of spite, they won't answer it. It's like, well, no, we're, not playing, we're not playing that game. They're not open to change or being changed, or growing. It says, he looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. Amen. Said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Which you think, so in other passages of Scripture where Jesus does a healing, people are like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's incredible. We've never seen anything like this. This is the finger of God. It's, it's an amazing thing for celebration. It says they glorify God. They worship God after it happens. Here's how the Pharisees respond. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. You're just doing too much good stuff, man. And we're tired of it. You know, it's an amazing thing. It's like they completely missed the point. There's a guy that's able to heal like that. He didn't even do anything. It wasn't like he, he cast a spell or picked up any dirt and threw him on the guy or had some special thing that he did. He just said, hey, stretch out your hand and it's healed. And they completely missed the point that like, well, how does something like that happen? Seems like God's got to be involved on some level, right? They missed that point and all they see is, you're making us look bad. You're taking away our spotlight. says they go out and they plot with the Herodians. Uh, it's uh, King Herod and uh, they're kind of his political people of the time. And they start plotting, how, to, how are we going to kill Jesus? Not even like, how are we going to discredit him anymore? How are we going to take him out of power? How are we going to get him out of Israel? Nothing like that. Like, nth level, we're done with all that other stuff. We've already tried. It doesn't work. We, you know what? Someone's got to die. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. What takes people from being like, when God, 
kind of orders everything for the Israelites when they're coming out of Egypt and they're in the desert. He begins to give them an order, a hierarchy of society. And, and one of those things is like you have the religious leaders on the top who are supposed to help people. It's like, look, you're really close with God. And so you're supposed to help people understand how do I walk with God? How do I live in light of God? How do I live with God kind of idea? Amen. And that's their job. They don't just, listen, <clears throat> they don't just study the law. They're not just supposed to study the law so that they can tell people, you know, here's what I know. They study the law so they can help people live with God. So they can help people be in relationship with God. What moves people from that category, like you're God's emissary, you're God's helper, to you're plotting to kill somebody? And ironically, the very person who is God. How do you move from here to there? Now I'll say this, it's surprisingly easy. For one, the Bible says that darkness lives within us. That's why the Bible says things like, you can go to the next slide. Uh, That's why the Bible says things like, when you break one part of the law, you're breaking the whole law. It's not saying they're exactly the same, like the the cultural repercussions for, for lying to someone and saying, no, you really do look good in that dress is the same as you murdered someone. It's not saying those things have equal weight. It's saying they're both the breaking of the law. And what it means is, man, if you're capable of breaking the law in this area, you're actually capable of breaking the law in this area. You either believe the law is good and right, or you don't. You either believe this is the highest order of things, or you don't. And you'll find your different ways, right? Like, uh, how many people have ever, how many people have ever watched someone else do something and you were like, I can't believe they did that. Raise your hand if you've ever seen someone else do something, you're like, oh my gosh, that's really out there, right? Yeah, and you're like, oh my, other people, right? Wow. And how many people have ever, you're old enough in your life, you've done something, you're like, I can't believe I did that. That's nutty, Right? And the reality is all the people that raised their hand the first hand, first time are looking at the people around them. You're the people they were looking at that were like, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> yeah. Because it, it lives in us. It's surprisingly easy how you move to someone's like, I believe God, I walk with God, I do these things, and oh, I killed someone, I murdered him. <laughs> and I know, some of you are like, Listen, Pastor Michael, that might be surprisingly easy for someone like you with your temper and your impatience and all those kind of things, but not for a gentle soul like me. Really, you just haven't been in the right circumstances yet. You just haven't been in the right circumstances yet. And that's what God is saying about us. That's why it's so easy to transition from hero to villain for human beings. Because someone's like, I would never murder someone. Of course you wouldn't murder someone for cutting you off. I would, but you wouldn't. (laughs) But if someone did something to your kids, where's where's that spot in your head that you're like, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. And people have it. People have it. And the Bible is saying that, and so it's saying, man, you got to figure this stuff out now so that when those situations come up, you still do the right thing. Amen. The Bible, we might interpret it this way. It says it this, be ready in season and out of season. Amen. Man, there are times when you feel like you're your best and you're being your best. You're like, man, I, this, is, this is a spiritual high for me. I've never loved people more. I've never been more patient. I've never been more empathetic, blah, blah, blah. And there are other times when it's like, look, man, I'm at my max. If one more thing happens, somebody's going to die. Right? We, we reach our limits. And, and what is it that drives us there? Well, what the Pharisees will look at this. Surprisingly easy. Number one, Jesus disagreed with them. Jesus disagreed with them. How many people, raise your hand if anybody's ever disagreed with you. Raise your hand if anybody's ever disagreed with you. People disagree with me all the time. And I know you're shocked because you're like, but you're always right. Preach it, brother. 
I am preaching it. People disagree with me all the time. And here's the thing. Like sometimes people disagree with me and we have differences of opinion. And so they're only wrong like a little bit because it's an opinion, right? They're still wrong, but it's like it's just a little bit because everybody's entitled to their own opinion. But sometimes I've had people disagree with me about stuff. It's like, but I know the Bible. I read the Bible and you don't. So why are you arguing with me about this? I was talking with one of my friends one time, and uh, we were talking about love. <clears throat> and I've sa- I said the same thing to my friend, that we were talking about different things and relationships that this person had been in and everything. We were talking about what love was. And I said, well, you know, biblically, love is, is not a feeling. It's when you give yourself to someone else. And we probably talked about that for another hour and a half. Because the person just disagreed. They were like, no, it's not. I think it's more like this. And they wanted to nuance it in a way that lets you off. And that's what people like to do. It's like, the Bible says this, and people are like, I mostly agree with that, except for this one part where it makes it easier for me to not be that or not do that. And so we talked about that back and forth. And if you've ever had a discussion with me where we disagree, you know, I'm happy to continue talking with you as long as you don't agree. I'll just keep going as long as it takes to get you to the spot that you realize you're wrong. And so we're talking about it for a long time, and the person said, they were saying that they thought love was, um, I forgot how they said it, but basically like, there's an exchange, you get something for love. And I was saying, no, love's like a giving away. And they said something, something, and I said, uh, so, but if, if nobody's there to see it, or if, if you don't get anything for it, you're saying then it's not love. Like you do something for someone, but they don't give you anything back, then it's not love. And they paused for a minute and they said, well, about that part, we can agree. <laughs> right? And I was just amazed. I was like, that is, that's nutty that you just cannot say, but that's how we are. We like draw our lines. We're like, ah, man. People disagree with people all the time. It's part of community. And how we handle disagreements goes a long way to whether we're a hero or a villain. How many people have ever said or done something that you wish you hadn't because someone, it started with someone disagreeing with you, right? We disagree all the time about big things, about small things. I talk to so many couples, it's like, this disagreement started about nothing, And then we were on the brink of going to jail. Elizabeth and I, that's how our relationship started, actually. We had so much fun with each other. We loved each other uh, and had so much fun hanging out with each other, whatever. But we're both very strong personalities. (laughs) And so we'd, we'd have these disagreements where it was like, it was about nothing at all. And then at the end of the night, it was like, I'm surprised you're still alive. I'm surprised you're still here. Right? People disagree with us all the time. We were going to go with a bunch of friends to Chipotle the other night, and someone turned to their spouse and said, there's a panda right next door. And they said, why would you say that? They said, oh, they don't like Chipotle. What? (laughs) I mean, there's disagreements, but come on. (laughs) But here's the thing. Jesus disagreed with the Pharisees, and that started this ball rolling. Or it's like, man, you disagree with us about what we say, what we teach, what we say you should teach, what your disciples should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, how people should be responding to you. And what happens when people disagree with us is it begins to, in some capacity, if we let it erode our confidence in ourselves, it starts to chip away at our confidence, it starts to magnify our insecurities. That's what it is. You ever wonder why if you're married and you've gotten an argument for that's about nothing and all of a sudden it's about like everything? Like what's the big deal? And there are these power struggles that are going on and everything like that. But part of it is like we start saying things that like hit the other person's insecurities. Well, you always. Well, you never. Well, you know what? You've always done this. You've always treated me like this. You never treat me like that. Blah, blah, blah. It chips away. Jesus disagreed with the Pharisees and that was enough to get the ball rolling. It started this thing, and here's the thing that's really important for us to know. People disagree all the time. That's part of being in community, is that people disagree. And 
<clears throat> it's really important to know because here's the thing. The Pharisees are supposed to be these people that's like, you're supposed to be like next to God. An example of what it means to be in relationship with God, to live with God. They're supposed to teach other people the same things. And you know what? God has called Christians to do that exact same thing. You'll be my witnesses. You're a light to the world. We're ambassadors for God as if he were making his plea through us, it says in the Bible. And here's the thing. We live in a world now that disagrees with us. It used to be, it's so funny, I'm old enough now to remember, like, Christians used to be the good guys in culture. Then really everybody else, if you weren't Christian, everybody else was mostly the bad guys. And they would say that. I'm not a good person like that. They go to church and they do those things. They're Christian, like, they're good people. But, and I, I've lived long enough to see that actually flip in our culture. Where if I tell people, like, we're on a plane and someone says, oh, yeah, we're meeting each other or whatever. And someone says, what do you do? And I say, I'm a pastor. Immediately, I know. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm under scrutiny. Yep. Oh. So you're, the, you know, there's all these other things attached now to being a Christian. People disagree with us. And the thing that God is saying is, man, people are going to disagree with you. It's okay for people to disagree with you. That's why Jesus says something like, love your enemies. He says, because you're going to have them. And if you don't, you're liable to treat them like enemies. Yeah, that's right. And I'm telling you, I want you to treat them like my father does. I want you to love them. And that's going to protect you from becoming a bad guy in your own story. They were my enemy. They did this. They said these things to me. They disagreed with me this way. And then you did something. And I know everybody knows that example because you've all been in an argument with someone where you said something. You're like, whoops, I didn't mean to blurt that out. Yeah. Or at the very least, afterwards, you were like, oh, I wish I hadn't said that. Yeah. Very simple. Jesus disagreed with them. This one's a little bit more. Jesus humiliated them. He humiliated them in a lot of different ways. Some of it was their fault. They came and they would bring questions that Jesus wasn't supposed to be able to answer and he would answer them and it's like, that makes Jesus look good and them look bad. At one point it says, they didn't want to answer any, they didn't want to ask him any more questions because he kept answering them like that, making them look bad. At one point, Jesus just starts basically telling people like, hey, listen, don't follow the Pharisees. Don't do what they're doing. Don't, don't uh, do what they say, but don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. At one point, he calls them out in a speech as a famous, woe to you, Pharisees and teachers of the law and these kind of things. Woe to you, because you do these things, but you don't do these other things. And he calls them out publicly. He humiliated them. Raise your hand if you've ever been humiliated. Oh, yeah. yeah. Probably everybody in here, which means the same triggers exist for you as for them. Raise your hand if you've ever been humiliated and... You, you, you took revenge. You, you somehow, you did, it's like, okay, well, that's not going to stand. I'm going to get you back for that, right? You said something. You did something. There's a lot of not raised hands in here that are liars. <laughs> it's not like we don't live in the same world like we don't know, right? Raise your hand at least this. Raise your hand if you've ever been humiliated and you plotted revenge. You were like, this is how I'm going to get him back. I'm going to say that. You just wait, Right? Jesus humiliated them, and that's tough. I remember there was this time when I was a kid, and I was super, super young. Everybody's been humiliated in lots of different ways, but I was super, super young. It was before I even started school, so I must have been like four or five or something like that, and I was out playing with my friends in our front yard, and I was wearing some shirt, uh, some t-shirt or whatever, and one of the kids in the, in the, whatever it was, I guess it was a street. I don't think we lived on a cul-de-sac. Can't quite remember. It was a long time ago, but it had rained and he had picked up like this big old, like we were making like mud balls. And he picked up this big old mud ball and he said something and everybody kind of gathered into here. He's kind of like the kind of leader of the street or whatever. And the kids, I think he was a couple, little, little bit older than me. But he took the mud ball and he put it right into my chest and smeared it around my, my chest. And number one, I was humiliated in front of all the other kids. But number two, then I had to go inside and explain it to my mom which is like, why is my t-shirt like this or whatever, which is also embarrassing. Even then, I think I had this thing of like, I don't think people are supposed to be able to do that to you kind of thing. And, that, and it was embarrassing in that capacity. 
but it was humiliating. And there have been other times in my life where someone humiliates me by something that they've said. And I got to tell you, like, I, I, I'm pretty good at this now. I used to be really bad. When someone would say something to me that was embarrassing or humiliating, I would come back so quick, the things that I would say, and I would go right to that. I wouldn't, like, ramp up to some mean thing. I would just go right to the thing. It's like, what's going to shut you up the fastest? And I would just say that thing. And that same trigger in us, that same response that said, you know, you, you have this verbal response or whatever. You know why you don't have a more visceral response? Because people are watching. You go to jail. Because there are consequences. And that's why the Bible says, man, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hell. He's saying, look, you would do these other things too if you could because you're human and you're broken. You just don't because there's consequences. Jesus disagreed with them. Jesus humiliated them. We all work through that. People disagree with us all the time. In particular, people disagree with you not just because of who you are or what you do or whatever, but they disagree with you because of your faith. We live in a culture now that disagrees with us online, on TV shows. I have never, ever been to a comedy show. I shouldn't say that. I'd say 98% of the comedy shows that I've, that I've seen and been to there's always a bit about Christianity. There's always a bit where they make fun of Christians, they make fun of the faith, they make fun of... It's just, that's just the way it is now. And if you're a Christian sitting in the audience, you're like, oh, this is awkward. <laughs> and unless you believe what Jesus says about love your enemies, if it, unless you believe Jesus is teaching us the right way to live, and that's really the only way to live then these same triggers that turn these guys, these good guys, into villains. And, and listen, there's background. There's stuff where it's like they just wanted to be in the positions they were in for the power and the authority and the, the attention and those kinds of stuff. There's lots of other things that are going on. But all those things live in us as well. But Jesus disagreed with them. He humiliated them. And then this last thing, probably the biggest thing for them, he threatened their status quo. Things began to change. And I thought about this for us because, like I said, things are changing in our culture. It used to be, you know, uh, it's really hard to argue. I know people do argue it, but it's really hard to argue that, that at the very least, the, the United States, you might not always be able to say that it was always a Christian nation, but it was certainly founded in Christian values. And even if, you know, some will say this forefather, they didn't believe this or they didn't whatever. Yeah, sure. But they believed in the values and they founded the country in those values and those prevailed for, for eons until like here we are now. And now some of those values are eroding away and they're going away and they're changing and these kind of things like that. And the status quo is changing for us. We used to have the moral authority in culture, but we don't anymore. Or at least that's not the way culture sees it anyways. We probably still see it that way. Yeah. But the status quo is changing. And for them, it was like, they say this in another passage of scripture when they begin to plot to kill Jesus. They say, man, if we don't stop this guy, the Romans are going to come in. The Romans are going to take our temple and they're going to take our nation. So Jesus is threatening, number one, he's threatening the, their authority, their power, what gives them prestige. But then even bigger for them, they're like, man, you're, the temple for them was the center of their culture. Like we have church and it's a similar idea, but it was even more so for them with the temple. That was the way you did everything. Everything revolved around the temple. This is, the Romans are going to come and take our temple and our nation. I don't know what you hang on to. I don't know what makes for your status quo. I don't know what makes for your joy, your comfort, your security. Some people, it's like, oh, I'm just happy to be married. Some people are like, oh, I'm happy we have this family. I'm happy we live in this house or this neighborhood. Or live in this way. We, have, we make this much money and we go on these kind of vacations and we do these kind of things. But when something comes along and threatens your status quo, threatens your security, your comfort, it has the ability to change you from someone who's supposed to be a hero into a villain because all of a sudden you have to defend it. And... The grip with which you hold on to those things
is the strength, the, the ugliness that you're willing to put out to keep a hold of them. There's passages in the Bible where it's like, hey, don't love the world or anything in it because it's all passing away. And he's not saying that because God didn't create beautiful things or God didn't give you beautiful things. He's saying that because, oh, it all passes away. And so we've all probably known people, it's like you, you, you lose something, a spouse, a, a child, a pet, or whatever, and it changes them. It changes how they are and how they react to people and how they work in the world. We were just watching a show, uh, and it was a historical kind of thing, uh, and this guy that was kind of a, a really empowered guy in the show, and then at one point, I guess, ran for governor, and then later it said, like, he took his own life. And so I looked it up, and I'm like, what happened? He lost his brother. His brother passed away in a tragic accident, and he turned to alcohol and drugs, and it just was a downhill spiral for him. And this person that was, like, up here and running for governor, even, took his own life because some things happened in life because life is broken and broken things happen. He threatened their status quo. What's your status quo and what threatens it? Because that's the thing that we're likely to be the ugliest towards, likely to move that way uh, in the wrong way for. I, I was saying this to some people that I know. Um, uh, when couples begin to argue, um, a lot of times, you know, you think you're arguing about whatever starts the argument, but then the argument goes on for quite some time, and you're, you cease at some point to even argue. You don't even remember what started the argument. You're just arguing about all these other things, and I was telling them, I was like, man, there's something that happens with us as people, as human beings, especially in couples, where it becomes more about this kind of power play than anything else, and you're trying to maintain this imaginary power balance. And that's why the argument goes from here to here to here to here to here. It's like, that's why it always is switching topics because someone's like, oh, they've got a good point on that one, but I gotta, I'm going to come around on the flank with this other thing that they, well, you always, and it's something completely different or whatever. It's like, are oh, you just trying to maintain power? And you see it in our own interpersonal relationships. And so we definitely see it in this kind of idea. Where our status quo is threatened, we're likely to become the bad guys. We have it in us because that dark side lives in us. And that makes it all the more important for us to tamp it out, for us to recognize these things in our own lives. Music team, you can come up and figure it out. How do you respond when someone disagrees with you? And, and, and maybe even deeper than that, what is it that, that makes you so angry or hurt so much when someone disagrees with you? Have you ever gotten in like an argument about like someone, like something silly like, what's your favorite movie? I was just on Facebook yesterday. Okay, this is an example of my own life. I was just on Facebook yesterday and I saw this weird, it was a panel and you know how Facebook puts in like different groups into your feed to see if you want to join those groups or whatever? It was a panel and it was Superman. He was facing off with Godzilla and it said Superman versus Godzilla and I was like, well, that's just silly. He would grab the tail, throw him in his face and done deal, right? Superman all the way. So I opened up the comments. I started reading the comments through. Man, a lot of people like Godzilla. And apparently there was a, there was a comic that was done that was, super, that was basically Godzilla versus, I think, the Justice League. And Superman was a big part of it. And the Justice League loses and Superman dies. And I'm like, well, that's stupid. And I, it, here's what's funny. This is funny, but it, listen, it lives in you too. It was funny. I was reading down through the comments and people were saying what I perceive as really stupid things. They're like literally arguing about two fictional characters as if their, their canon is fact somewhere. And one guy literally said, and I liked it. Usually I don't like anything because I don't want to show up again, but it's like I liked it. One guy said, it just depends on who the writers are. Amen. But I remember thinking, like, as people were saying these things about, well, Godzilla would do this, and Godzilla can do this, and Godzilla did that. I remember, like, I was getting worked up. I wanted to argue about why Superman was better. Obviously, because he is, and I want people to know stuff. But, but have you ever been there where you're surprised? Like, I'm surprised at my response to this. Because the, the part of you is like, this is stupid and silly. And another part of you is like, it's stupid and silly, but they still should know. 
Man, that dark side lives in each one of us and different things move us from heroes to villains. You're supposed to be a hero in the world. And, and, and I don't mean that in that everybody should look at you and think of you as a hero. People should, but there are going to be people who don't. But at the very least, God should look at you and say, that's a hero. I put them on the earth to be a hero. Unless you are honest enough to recognize, man, the dark side lives in me. And you can recognize, here's what things turn... They dis, Jesus, he disagreed with them. Listen, people are going to disagree with you all the time. What does that do to you? How do you handle it? He humiliated, he humiliated them. What do you do when people make you look bad? How do you feel? What does it do inside you? Where do your thoughts go? These are the times you have to identify, man, not to a good place. And so where, do, where does God want my thoughts to go? And then what happens when your status quo is threatened? You know, that's supposed to be some of your story of why you're a hero. It's like you're going to face tragedy in a way more heroic than everybody else because you know something more, that there's a God, that he loves you, that he's forgiven you, that there's grace, that heaven awaits you, that this isn't life. This isn't the end. You're supposed to be that for people. So God's like, sometimes I let tragedies happen to you because you're supposed to be heroic in it. What happens when your status quo is threatened? What's the ugly that comes out? What are the lengths you're willing to go to to hold on to it? And some people, it's, it's silly stuff, you know? Some people, it's like, I'm willing to cheat on my taxes because I want this much money back because I have plans for it. And listen, that's the same thing that, makes, that has the potential to make you a killer, that makes you a villain. And you, but you live with it and you allow it to live within you. Or sometimes like you'll say stuff like this sometimes and people celebrate it. Yep, that's me. Okay, man, you're going to be them too. It could have gone the complete opposite way. The Pharisees in their role with culture could have been like, you know, everything that we see, we think this guy's the Messiah. This guy's the one. We should all be listening. We should all be following. And instead, they became his enemies. And the things that they did, just nutty. Not just the evil that they did, but the evil they led other people to. You know, when Jesus is crucified, it says the Pharisees are the ones stirring up the crowd. And, and there's a guy, Pilate, we'll talk about him later, but there's a guy, Pilate, he's trying to let Jesus go. And Jesus is like, and Pilate's like, I, listen, I don't find any guilt in him. His blood's not on my hands. And the crowd, stirred up by the Pharisees, says this. His blood be on our hands and on our children. What? Why would you ever say something like that? They were stirred up by these guys. And you've seen like mob mentality, like how it goes. The Pharisees, they became bad guys. They were supposed to be good guys and they became bad guys by simple little things because they didn't handle them. They didn't tackle them. How will you?